Mornings at 12. The 6 o'clock news starts right now. And new at 6, a state representative serving the San Antonio and Alamo Heights area, the latest lawmaker to test positive for the coronavirus. Republican Steve Allison of District 121 receiving Regeneron treatments to deal with the virus. That's according to Scott Braddock with the Quorum Report, which is reporting that he has been receiving Regeneron. The 74-year-old Allison hasn't made mention of this on his social media pages. The Quorum Report also reporting Allison is expected back on the House floor next week. Harassed and threatened, it is the latest stress being added to an already beleaguered group of people on the front lines fighting this pandemic. Local health care workers say it is happening at work. They're dealing with disgruntled patients and their family members coming to them when they are sick or injured. Our Tiffany Huerta spoke to a physician's assistant about what he has seen, what he is dealing with during this latest surge. When you see as many patients as we're seeing now, we're trying to accommodate this pandemic and the testing efforts and treatments. Uh, it's very difficult to always keep to a schedule. Longer wait times are back thanks to the recent surge in COVID cases. And Joseph Dominguez, a physician assistant at Quality Urgent Care, says unhappy patients are taking their anger over it out on staff. Patients calling you names basically expressing how disgruntled they are with the wait time. You can see online just how long the wait times are at the San Antonio clinics, some averaging five hours. Appointments are appointments and we have those for specific reasons for our COVID testing, but we also are an open access clinic. We see whatever patient comes through the door. Dr. Nimish Patel, the medical director for Quality Urgent Care of America, says healthcare workers are being mistreated, like getting spit on, cars being keyed, their belongings being stolen, and general harassment in person and online. Last week, we told you about reports of San Antonio Hospital employees being threatened. Our staff have been cursed at, screamed at, um, threatened with bodily harm, and even had knives pulled on them. We've had to increase our security and actually called on our SAPD for very disruptive cases. Dominguez says they will keep doing the best they can. We are all doing our best to take care of each and every one of you with the most appropriate care. Tiffany Huertas, KSAT 12 News. What started as a school evacuation ended in a stabbing earlier today. SAPD officers tell us a white car crashed into the Brooks Lone Star Academy, causing a gas leak. That's where police say a 27-year-old driver of that car began arguing with a 34-year-old passenger. Police say the passenger allegedly pulled a gun on the driver and then stabbed him in the arm and the neck. This happened in the school parking lot, but police say students there were not in danger. The only point where the children may have been in danger was with the gas leak, and that's where they were evacuated out of the school until um, it was, uh, the gas leak was under control. And no charges have been filed as of last check, and police say whatever happened here is still under investigation. A lot of questions still unanswered following a shooting at a northwest side park overnight. It happened around 1045 at O.P. Schnabel Park off Bandera Road. Police tell us a teenage boy was walking along the trail there when he was shot in the arm. He then managed to jump a fence, knock on the back door of a home off Brian Clark Street for help. He was taken to the hospital. He's expected to be OK. Officers say they don't know who shot the teen or why he was walking alone in the park after dark. A family left without a home after it was destroyed in a fire earlier today. A tough loss for any family, no matter the circumstances. But as Sarah Acosta reports, this home built by the homeowner's father 50 years ago. Devastated. Victor Aguilar woke up to members of his family shouting to get out after a wall of their home ignited in flames. The fire trapping him in his front bedroom with his wife. He was able to climb out a window. He says it was more difficult for his wife to get out. Now she's got a prosthetic leg. I couldn't get her out the window. Uh, the EMS came and helped her get out. So she's critical condition at BMC right now, so let's keep her in prayer. She wasn't burned, but taken in critical condition for smoke inhalation. Aguilar was treated for smoke inhalation on scene and is going to be okay. His father, brother, and three other adults were also in the home and got out safely. Firefighters say they were called out to the 12,000 block of La Lida Street just after three this morning. Fire crews were able to contain the fire within an hour. 
One of the women in the home told firefighters she used the microwave, then shortly after she noticed a spark, and then the whole wall was on fire. Firefighters say they believe the cause was electrical. The fire spread to the attic, then through the rest of the home. Firefighters calling this a complete loss. Now the sun is up. You can really see how intense this fire was and the damage it did to this home. The roof completely collapsed in, charring to the front of the home and all that water damage in the driveway. For Aguilar, it's the memories he's holding on to. After losing all the family photographs of his childhood home that his father built, 50 years ago. I got here when I was eight years old. My dad's got a super eight film of me jumping up and down that that far wall over there saying this is my room. It was just concrete slab. There was no houses out here at the time. Sarah Costa, KSAT 12 News. New at six, another perspective on the fall of Afghanistan from an American journalist who lived in San Antonio. An Army veteran, J.P. Lawrence, now writes for the U.S. military newspaper Stars and Stripes. Jesse DeGoyado says his article that you can find right now on KSAT.com is a personal account of his final few days in Afghanistan. J.P. Lawrence's article in Stars and Stripes begins with life as it seemed before the Taliban seized the Afghan capital of Kabul. The same day I went to the zoo, we decided like, hey, um, we should probably leave. Three days later, the Taliban had overrun the city and the country. It was very, very quick. Still, reporter J.P. Lawrence and his colleagues managed to barely miss the chaos that erupted at the airport Monday. We were with like the last batch of embassy people because they decided to close down the embassy. Yet Lawrence says he worries about their Afghan colleague who was unable to leave. He saved our lives, my life and we wanted to make sure that the, the U.S. can get him out. Having spent more than three years covering America's longest war, Lawrence says many Afghans actually believed. The war on terrorism was so important that the U.S. would stay in Afghanistan for, you know, 30, 40, 50 years like they were um, at the, um, like in Germany or in Japan. He says they also thought since the Afghan military had been better trained and equipped by the Americans, they'd face down the Taliban, but that was not to be. Lawrence says a text from a veteran who'd served in Afghanistan speaks for many others like him. He told me in a text message, this is going to hurt for a long time, man. I think a lot of other veterans kind of feel the same way. Jesse DeGoyado, KSAT 12 News. Despite whatever hesitancies its patients may have, a local cancer treatment center telling its patients to get the COVID-19 vaccine. Doctors with the START Center for Cancer Care believe getting the vaccine would protect the vulnerable community battling cancer or blood disorders from being severely ill should they contract the virus. But of course, you should consult with your own doctor before you make any decision. So far, the Start Center has offered 1,700 full doses of the Moderna vaccine to its patients. They have not seen any severe reactions to the vaccine in general. One of their patients, 66-year-old Warren Larson, says he too was hesitant about that vaccine. But his doctor provided enough advice to change his mind. I didn't want to take the vaccine. I did. I did have an immune response to it. It only lasted a day. It's a lot better than uh, having to spend days or weeks fighting off uh, COVID. And, and I would just say, listen to your doctor. The START Center provides the Moderna vaccine due to its shelf life. They started offering a third booster shot for patients undergoing active treatments today. Their goal is to buy, provide 300 or more of those booster shots by the end of the week. New at six, our smartphones track so many things about us, like our locations, our heart rate, even oxygen levels. A new app says it can also use that information to predict when we may be getting sick. During this pandemic, that's never been more important. Ursula Perry explains how it works. Movement means freedom to occupational therapist Mary Cunningham. She loves to walk her dog Kobe, but a life threatening condition that causes her to develop blood clots often brings everything to a stop. So I've been to the ICU three times with quite a, this day, like multiple days. A friend suggested Mary test out the app Sick Predict. Sick Predict monitors health metrics from an iPhone, like heart rate and oxygen levels, to tell you when you might be getting sick. A one means you're doing great. One night, Mary saw a 10. But we caught it early, so I avoided the ER, which was great, and I avoided the ICU. 
patients that can deteriorate really quickly and their health can go so bad so quickly. Having this application can definitely uh, help us be on top of the problems earlier. Primary care doctor Alicia Rodriguez Jorge uses her wearable device to track her health and says while it doesn't replace her, it can help get patients to her sooner. Sick Predict CEO Joshua Salman and his business partner developed this app with research from Stanford and Harvard. There are many illnesses where we're seeing tremendous success. Um, the flu, COVID, uh, norovirus, um, pulmonary or lung issues, some cardiac issues. And for patients like Mary Cunningham, a heads up on her changing health can prevent hospitalization or even worse. And I don't have to always feel like I'm a ticking time bomb. App wearables like Fitbit and other smart watches are also being developed at major institutions like Harvard and Stanford. Researchers stress that this data does not replace a doctor, but it can help get patients to a doctor sooner and even maybe help them take better care of themselves too. Ursula Perry, KSAT 12 News. Let's take a look outside with live cam this evening. 95 degrees out there, and it's feeling like it should it's, for August. Yes. I mean, it's feeling like the back half of August. Hey, I have a surprise for you guys. Our high temperature this afternoon was 98. For those of you oh. keeping score at home, that We're makes in today. The studio. That would be me. <laughs> We're in the studio. That makes today the hottest day so far this year. Here on out though, back half of the month, our average highs do start to drop back off by the end of August. Our average high will be around 94, but uh, still plenty of time to squeeze in a few more days like this. Highs in the upper 90s. We still haven't hit 100 at the airport yet, but places like Catula, uh, even Del Rio, you've already seen 100 a few times this summer. 103 was the high in Catula this afternoon, 99 the high in Carrizo Springs. Things are pretty quiet out there. We do have a couple of thunder showers, especially west of 35 and through about sunset. We'll hold on to a low chance of a spotty shower here or there, but for the most part, just hot and humid as we wrap up your Wednesday. I'll be back in just a bit with a look at the full forecast and a tropics update. We'll be right back. Check out the roads out there. This is I-35 at Maine. We're looking at both the upper and the lower decks. And you can see down low it seems like stop and go traffic out there, not moving as quickly as some of the upper decks. Again, this is near downtown I-35 at Maine. Some parents are dealing with a bumpy start to the school year when it comes to transportation. Our Samuel King has more on what's making this year so much more challenging. I don't trust the bus anymore. Melissa Richardson knew there would be some delays after the first day of school at Cibolo Valley Elementary last week, but she didn't expect to wait more than two hours for her first grader to come home. She called the school looking for answers. We've already dropped her off. Yeah, we have her. Yeah, she's here. And we're like, which is it? Because you either do or you don't. It took her husband driving around the neighborhood until he caught up with the bus around 530 to find their daughter. Richardson says she later spoke with officials with Church Cibolo Universal City ISD who reviewed video footage. She was never dumped in a random neighborhood, but she was constantly taken to different random neighborhoods instead of where she was supposed to go. Other parents reaching out to KSAT 12 News with similar complaints. A spokesman for the district says it's all hands on deck as the district deals with driver shortages made more acute by the pandemic. He went on to say in a statement, districts, ours included, spend the first few weeks balancing bus loads and adjusting bus routes to meet the needs of this year's riders. Morning arrival and afternoon drop off times are not where we would like them, but they are improving. Meanwhile, Northeast ISD also feeling the pandemic strain. Parents reporting delays in packed buses. The district dealing with more students on board, but fewer drivers to take them to school. We have uh, drivers out on uh, COVID leave because they were either exposed or uh, perhaps some had a positive test uh, without symptoms. And so um, they are quarantining to keep everybody safe. Other districts also say staffing shortages will likely continue to have an effect on school transportation, at least in the short term. They're asking parents for something else that may be in short supply right now. Patience. Samuel King, KSAT 12 News.
Let's take a look outside with Sky 12 flying high above the city right near the airport there. And uh, it looks a little bit hazy from this picture, but you don't have to look at it to know it's hot. Oh, yeah, we Nine. know it's steamy. So I know at five o'clock Katie said our high so far is 97. Mm -hmm. We broke the high for the season so far. Yep. 98. So each day, it's interesting, each day from the Weather Service, we have a preliminary climate report comes in, which gives us the low, the high, any rain. And then the Weather Service goes back in, double checks, and that's where they discovered that we did briefly touch 98 this afternoon. Then we got the final climate report after the 5 o'clock newscast. So that's why you always got to stick around until 6 to get that official high temperature for the day. We haven't cooled off very much yet. Uh, it's still 97 at the airport. That's the number you're going to see in white. The heat index or what it feels like is the number in yellow. So feeling like 104 when you factor in the humidity and we have elevated heat indices uh, above 100 degrees in many spots, essentially with the exception of the hill country currently with rain chances dropping out of the forecast after about the next couple of hours. Uh, the focus for the rest of the week all the way through the upcoming weekend is going to be on our typical summertime sizzle heat and humidity not going anywhere anytime soon. We'll continue to see our afternoon high temperatures mid to upper 90s, not expecting a lot of relief in terms of humidity in the afternoon. So that's going to keep our heat index. This top number here above 100 each afternoon, but we could even see briefly some periods with the heat index above 105. So for those of you spending extended period of time outdoors, make sure you're staying hydrated and also taking frequent breaks because uh, we're in the thick of it here as far as the summer heat and humidity goes. A couple of lingering thunder showers off to the west of 35. There's a big cluster of storms uh, off to the west of Eagle Pass. That does appear to be dropping due south, so I do not anticipate that uh, impacting parts of Maverick County over the next couple of hours. There are just a couple uh, little blips here on the radar right over Carrizo Springs there, a little non severe thunder shower. This thing is teeny, teeny tiny. It's got a couple of lightning strikes. Otherwise, uh, just some moderate to briefly heavy rain. Otherwise, things are quiet along and east of I-35. There was some better rain up near Bryan College Station and the Houston area this afternoon. We were hopeful that maybe a couple little downpours would pop up closer to the I-35 corridor. In fact, this Futurecast model thinks that's what's currently happening. That's not the case, so I'm, I mean, our rainfall window is really rapidly closing here. Uh, nonetheless, for the next couple of hours until we get past sunset, a little pop up is not out of the question. We've got a few of those outflow boundaries dancing around out there, so that could fire off one or two more spotty showers. Otherwise, rain free tonight through tomorrow afternoon. Also through Friday and the upcoming weekend, you'll notice a couple of little blips here Friday afternoon down closer to the coast. DeWitt County, Hallettsville, Lavaca County down a little bit closer to the Gulf of Mexico. You could see a stray little shower each afternoon as we get closer to the weekend, uh, but essentially will be rain free for the next several days. Uh, the reason for the rain the past couple of days was a nice little short wave or a piece of rain making energy uh, that moved in from the west. That is on its way out. It is lifting off to the northeast, and so that's where our rain chances really fall out of the forecast, and we'll see quiet summertime weather for the next several days. Tracking the tropics, it's been busy out there. We've got Hurricane Grace now in the Caribbean moving west toward the Yucatan Peninsula. Uh, that is not going to be an issue for the Gulf of Mexico and the Gulf Coast, but that will send a lot of rain to parts of Mexico over the next several days. And then we've got Tropical Storm Henri south of Bermuda. This looks like it'll take a sharp north turn over the next few days, and by late this week and early next week could actually approach parts of the northeast. So a couple things going out in the tropics, but nothing that will affect the Texas Gulf Coast at this time. A look at your Thursday 78 in the morning, mostly cloudy, mostly sunny by the afternoon 96. But again, that heat index will be elevated not only tomorrow, but also for the next several days. So remember to keep that water close by. Mm -hmm. guys. Thanks, Katie. Mm -hmm. All right, Larry, there are some questions about who the Cowboys will and won't be playing in the preseason. Yes, and their next preseason game is against the Houston Texans. Quarterback Dak Prescott says he wants to play against them, but it's not looking good. But how about Ezekiel Elliott? Does he want to play? He answers that coming up. Plus, SAISD canceled football scrimmages. We got the details coming up. With high school 
football kicking off next Thursday. San Antonio Independent School District canceled seven football scrimmages due to precautionary measures. With COVID-19 cases rising locally and across the state, SAISD is being cautious to protect their regular UIL season. SAISD football teams will still scrimmage other district teams this weekend, but will not scrimmage non-district teams. SAISD Athletics Director Brian M. Clancy told us the reason behind this is to limit exposure to students from other districts that are not following the same COVID protocols and procedures that they are following in SAISD. So here are those canceled football scrimmages. You have Brackenridge versus Southside, Burbank and Austin Travis, Edison versus Central Catholic, Highlands and Hondo, Sam Houston versus Cotula, Lanier and Floresville, and YMLA versus John Paul II. Pro football coverage powered by Davis Law Firm. Dallas Cowboys quarterback Dak Prescott was hoping to get some preseason game reps Saturday against the Houston Texans, but it doesn't look like that's going to happen. Head coach Mike McCarthy said, quote, there's a good chance he probably won't play, end quote. Coach already said he will use the fourth and final preseason game against Jacksonville to evaluate those fighting for a roster spot. But how about running back Ezekiel Elliott? Does he want to play in a preseason game? It doesn't really matter to me. Uh, I feel like, you know, where I am right now, camp, uh, you know, I'm ready to play football. Um, but, you know, whatever coaches ask for me, you know, I'm going to go out there and do. Wide receiver Amari Cooper upped his workload today, getting some run in team periods. Now, Houston Texans defensive end Whitney Merciless is entering his 10th season with the team. The former outside linebacker had four sacks last season, but could get some new life in the Tampa 2 scheme, which asks edge rush rushers to get after the quarterback. As far as what we've seen uh, in camp, also in the game as well, too, when just playing a little bit more aggressive. Also, and the emphasis on making it, getting turnovers. We got three turnovers in the uh, preseason game uh, the other night. And uh, guys stripping at the ball, things like that, playing a lot faster, not even thinking. Uh, it's really just simple. Just go see ball, go get ball. Texans released their second depth chart of the preseason, and Deshaun Watson is still listed as the fourth quarterback. UTSA quarterback Jordan Weeks tweeted today he's entering the transfer portal. He also thanked coaches and his teammates for the past couple of years. Weeks out of Wimberley High School played in nine games with the Roadrunners in three seasons. In high school volleyball last night, the Brandeis Broncos improved to 10-0 in front of a Rockets home gym with a dominant sweep of Antonian. As always, the offense ran through TCU commit Carly Ferris. She dished out 31 assists. Fellow future Horn Frog Jalen Gibson led the team with 17 kills. Ferris and Gibson are two of the 10 seniors on the roster, and their collective experience is a big reason why the Broncos are so good this early into the season. It's definitely fun. You know, this, this past weekend in KD, it was, it was so much fun being able to be with each other. And, you know, especially overnight, you know, all that bonding time and stuff is so great, especially since we've been together. You know, we have 10 seniors. That's an old team. And being able, knowing that we've had each other all of high school, you know, definitely shows out on the court right now. Brandeis returns to the court on Thursday morning in their first match of the Northeast ISD tournament. Ten seniors, that's an old team. What are they, 18 years old? <laughs> yeah, it is. They're all so young still. Come well, and, and what, at least two of them going to D1 programs? Yes. Yeah, that's awesome. <laughs> Pretty nice. <laughs> Thanks, Larry. Larry. We'll be right back. We have some late breaking news we are following just into the newsroom. This is a look from Sky 12 over a home on the far northwest side. This is on the 25,800 block of Enchanted Don. We're told Bear County Sheriff's Office has discovered two bodies, two males with gunshot wounds. All this now under investigation. And to give you an idea where Enchanted Dawn is, it's near Bernie Stage Road. Again, two bodies found inside a home. One is of a teen male. One is of a male in his 40s. We are told by Bear County investigators that teenager did not live at that house and that they were called to do a wellness check on the home. And that's when the two bodies were discovered. They believe that they had been there for less than a day. Now they're investigating this as a homicide right now. Uh, this could change as the investigation continues, but right now two bodies found inside a home in the 25,800 block of Enchanted Don. Of course, if anything new happens, we will update it online and on air. 
Let's turn now to today's KSAT Q&A. A lot to cover here as well. We are joined by San Antonio Mayor Ron Nirenberg today. Uh, Mayor, let's get right to a big question that so many people across the city, across the county have. These mask mandates. It is, you know, I keep describing it as legal whiplash trying to figure out what rule of the day stands. So we yeah. know that the city was uh, granted a temporary injunction Explain what that rule does right now for local schools. The temp oh, thank you, Myron. Good to join you. Uh, the temporary injunction means that the governor's emergency order, which we have uh, argued is unconstitutional on its face because he suspends our ability to deal with the emergency locally, which we're obligated to do, um, that the temporary injunction now has nullified that order, at least temporarily, which means that uh, the Bear County Public Health Authority's directive to schools to mandate masks for their campuses uh, is in place and it has the force of law. So that's what uh, you're seeing play out in, in terms of the courts. But I will remind folks, the science of this has not changed. What we know has not changed that will work to help slow down the spread of this virus and to save lives. And that is masking up and getting vaccinated. So. If we are interested in protecting the health and safety of our community, particularly the young people and the students in our community who are not yet eligible because they're 12 years or younger, um, we need to make sure uh, to mask up and get vaccinated, particularly on those school campus environments. Obviously, the governor and the attorney general fighting this uh, temporary injunction. Is this something that will go to the Texas Supreme Court and they will come down on a, a ruling on this like they have in other cases? Well, we, we'll see. Um, right now, the, the governor has filed uh, another appeal, uh, which is currently at the fourth court of appeals. We, we are awaiting word back from them. Uh, and if uh, he again loses on the substance of our argument, which we expect he will, uh, it's very likely that he'll appeal it up to the Texas Supreme Court. But again, I'd remind you that, that, that what we are arguing for is the ability to put mandates in place that are in accordance with the health guidance, particularly the CDC and our local public health authorities, about saving lives and protecting the health and safety of our school communities and, and the community in general. So those facts are not going to change. Um, what might happen within the, the legal confines of this legal fight in Texas might. But I'll also tell you, that there is a federal court now, a federal case that has been filed in Austin as of today on behalf of uh, disabled students whose um, immunocompromised situations uh, put them in serious harm's way if a school is not able to require masks. Uh, we also heard today that the Biden administration is looking at civil rights violations related to the governor's order preventing school districts from putting mask mandates in place to save the health and safety and lives of their students and their school communities. So there's a number of challenges unfolding, but I'll say again, what is consistent, what is true, what has not changed is the science of this. Masks work, vaccines work. If we wanna put an end to this pandemic, let's use them. And I know, Mayor, we have an explanation on that federal lawsuit you mentioned right now on our website at KSAT.com for more information on that. This is a tense time. We have children heading back to school, and it seems like parents and kids and teachers and school staff are caught in the middle of this back and forth on the mask mandate issue. And though you say that the, the temporary injunction does have the rule of law behind it, we still have districts all across town that are making different rules. So is there right. an effort being made to try to get everybody on the same page here? There, there absolutely is, which is why uh, as soon as we received word about the Delta variant and the CDC guidance to contain it uh, from uh, their health authorities uh, with regard to mask wearing and, and, and their advice, their guidance that people in school settings should be wearing masks, the local public health authority, which governs all of the school districts in our areas, made that very clear. Schools should be in masks. And so that has not changed. So uh, I feel uh, frustrated for the teachers and the students and the parents who are caught in the middle of this very unnecessary legal battle. But let's let's be clear here. Uh, the doctors, the teachers, uh, the parents, the students who are asking 
uh, for their legal authority to be restored to require masks on campus are standing firmly on the side of protecting public health and safety, particularly of those thousands of students who are under 12 years old who don't have the benefit of getting vaccinated. We need to remember them and protect them. It's on all of us as a community to do that. Let's let's shift gears here and talk a little bit about what's happening at the Alamo Dome right now as we speak. Sure. There are a lot of people who are changing their minds, who have who've decided, OK, I need to go out and get a shot. It, in, and in some cases, it seemed as if maybe that was easier said than done. But the city's doing something right now to make it very yeah. easy for people to get a shot. What is that? And, and yes. And, and so let, let's also remind folks the vaccine is safe. It's effective. It's free. You don't need insurance to get it. And we have a mass vaccination clinic open at the Alamo Dome Wednesdays through Fridays from 4 p.m. to 8 p.m. You can come and get your first dose or if you're on your second dose, you can get your second dose. But we just need to make sure that folks know that the vaccine is there. It's available. There's plenty of them. Uh, so if you need to get vaccinated, you can come right up to the Alamo Dome between 4 and 8, uh, 4 and 8 p.m. Uh, Wednesday through Friday. Uh, please do that. And, and I, I will emphasize the point, Steve. Uh, we know that the Delta variant has caused breakthrough infections. The vaccine does not stop transmission. What it prevents is serious illness and death. And unfortunately, we are seeing uh, nine out of 10 cases in the hospital are still among folks who are, back, who are unvaccinated. And the severest of those cases are unvaccinated. And they're ending up in the ICU on ventilators and ultimately some of them are passing away. And yesterday we reported that we had nine new deaths. One of them was a, a, a person in their 20s. Another was in the person in their 30s. The, the cases that are happening in the hospital among unvaccinated individuals are younger and younger. So it's, it's extremely important to protect your health and of those around you, get vaccinated if you're eligible. I want to ask you one more question because I had an elderly gentleman reach out to me and ask me this question. He's not internet savvy. He, he's being frustrated because he's trying to get a test to see if he's COVID positive or not. What is the best advice for people that are out there and they maybe can't check and make, a, make an online appointment for some of these locations? We have 13 um, public, uh, free public testing sites available around town. I understand if, if someone doesn't have internet access, it might be hard to find them, but they can call 311 and hit option eight, and they can be navigated to the one that's nearest to them. But also keep in mind, just about every clinic, uh, pharmacy, even grocery stores are now carrying tests. Uh, so the important thing is that if you are if you suspect you've been uh, you've got some symptoms and you may have been exposed to COVID-19, go get tested because the earlier find out, the earlier we can have uh, intervention and hopefully help you get better. But the most uh, important intervention that you can you can do when you're healthy and you don't have COVID is to make sure that if you're eligible, you do go get vaccinated. San Antonio Mayor Ron Nirenberg, as always, thanks for sharing some time with us. Thanks, y'all. Have a good night. You too. We'll be right back. Around Texas now, Harris County willing to pay up for people who live there to get their first dose of the COVID-19 vaccine. County Judge Lena Hidalgo announced that anyone who shows up to get the shot will get a hundred bucks, no questions asked. That was yesterday. Today, people were lined up waiting for the vaccination clinic to open. Over the past several months, the Delta variant of COVID-19 has spread quickly across Harris County, straining hospital systems. Over 98% of people currently hospitalized for COVID in the Harris Health System have not been vaccinated. That's according to a news release from Hidalgo's office. Live cam tonight, 94 degrees out there, and we saw some pretty widespread showers yesterday in our viewing area. Not so much today. No, not so much today, and that trend will continue as we get into tomorrow. So rain chances falling out of the forecast and the typical summertime heat and humidity will really take over as we finish out this work and school week. So uh, it is still really toasty out there. Thankfully, we've got a decent breeze in place. And in case you missed it earlier, our high temperature day today at the airport of 98 makes today the hottest day so far this year. Haven't hit 100 just yet. Got a couple of showers still out there. We'll take a look at radar and get you another look at your forecast coming up.
right. It is the hottest day of the year. Today is the day. Woohoo. Will it be Woo-hoo. the hottest day <laughs> and Renown hit triple digits? Eh. Yeah. I think it's I think we're going to hit triple digits next week. We oh okay. Well, you say that with such optimism. Just because I, I Myra's hanging on to hope that we won't. <laughs> I'm also hanging on to hope that we won't. It would be <laughs> just fine. Even if we get up to 99, that's fine. It's not 100. Sometimes I can be a bit of a contrarian, so yeah, this is an a, example okay. of touch. Well, of why we'll I'm going see. against Katie and Myra. Okay, we'll see. All right. See what happens. Yeah. You, you have more expertise than I do, so Well, I'm not feeling so good about my guests right now. <laughs> Depends on the day. Um, <laughs> we'll talk about our local forecast shortly, but I do want to update you again on what's going on in the tropics. Two systems. We're watching Hurricane Grace in the Caribbean and Henri, which is still a tropical storm south of Bermuda. And yes, that is how you pronounce that Henri, not Henry. Uh, so first, an update on Grace as of 4 p.m. There should be a new update here shortly. This is barreling toward the Yucatan Peninsula, still a Category 1 hurricane. It should make landfall as a Category 1 hurricane um, as we get into um, late tonight, early tomorrow. It passes over the Yucatan and then jumps back into the Bay of Campeche, Southern Gulf, as we get into Friday, but it is expected to be pushed into Mexico even after reemerging over open water. So uh, no impacts to our forecast expected. And here is Henri. I went ahead and put the pronunciation on there for you. The Hurricane Center actually with every name, they have a pronunciation guide. So I did double check and it's Henri. It's still a tropical storm south uh, southwest of Bermuda. Over the course of Friday into the weekend, it's expected to actually take a sharp turn off to the north and then approach parts of New England as we get into late this weekend. Um, and early next week, so by Sunday afternoon, potentially a Category 1 hurricane here and then making landfall across parts of New England. There's Boston, um, so that'll be an issue for that part of the country. But Henri, just like Grace, not expected to impact our forecast here locally. We've had a little short wave, a little piece of rain making energy with us the past couple of days. That is really situated in North Texas. Now we've got some rain from the DFW area over into North Louisiana that will continue to move northeast and away from us. And we're actually going to see high pressure subtly build in over the next couple of days. And over the course of the weekend, as that happens, that really puts the kibosh on any chance of rain. So I've bottomed out your rain chances uh, for the next several days all the way into early next week. So that means the focus here over the next few days is going to be on high heat index readings. So even at this hour, we've got a heat index of 104 at the airport in San Antonio, 108 out in Del Rio. That's what it feels like, feeling like 107 in New Braunfels with an air temperature of 92. And again, it's these high dew point numbers that can make it feels so much hotter than what it actually is. Essentially, everyone has dew points in the oppressive range. Beville, your sensors reading the 80s, which would just be not great at all, but your sensor typically reads the dew point a few degrees higher than what it actually is. So I would put you somewhere closer to where Victoria is, but doesn't really matter. It's hot and muggy out there this evening. We've got a couple of little thunder showers that have tried to develop west of 35, uh, generally around Carrizo Springs, just down to the south, right along 83. There were also a couple of showers north of Eagle Pass. Elsewhere, things are quiet, but for the next, let's say, hour, hour and a half, a few more little thunder showers should pop up after that. After sunset, rain chances fall out of the forecast tonight. Warm, muggy, and mostly cloudy to start the day tomorrow. High temperatures tomorrow afternoon. Back in the mid to upper 90s with the heat index above 100, not just tomorrow, but also for the next several days. So summertime sizzle will uh, take hold here for the short term, guys. Mm. All right. Thank you, Katie. Mm -hmm. In case you missed it, coming up next. Here is today's I See Why Am I. All students, staff, and visitors at Northside ISD must now wear masks when they head back to the classroom on Monday. The Board of Trustees voting unanimously to issue the temporary mask mandate last night. The mandate will go into effect on the first day of school and applies to all those indoors. SAISD issuing a similar mask mandate. However, they also require staff to be fully vaccinated by October 15th. Still working to identify a man who was run over and killed this morning. That crash happening just after midnight on I-35, not far from O'Connor Road on the northeast side. San Antonio police said the man was actually walking on the highway when he was hit by an SUV. 
The man pronounced dead at the scene. The driver did stop after the crash and is not expected to face any charges. Afghan interpreters who helped America's military in Afghanistan communicate with the locals are among the tens of thousands of others fearing they'll be abandoned and forgotten by the U.S. and targeted by the Taliban. Something like 80 to 90,000 people who directly helped the United States government when we were there. Only a fraction of those folks have gotten out so far. The winds are heavy and they're shooting spot fires some two, even five miles ahead. And here's an example of where this fire crossed the road and went straight up this hill. The Caldor fire prompting evacuations for nearly 200,000 in El Dorado County. The flames have already destroyed 50 homes in the small town of Grizzly Flats. The CDC director and other leaders outlining a new plan for Americans to get an extra dose eight months after you got your second shot of either Pfizer or Moderna. <laughs> All right, tonight on the Night Beat, I'll have an update for you on the two tropical systems, Hurricane Grace and Tropical Storm Henri. Ha, ha, ha. <laughs> Our producer, Bill, now has to give me $7. Yes. Uh, because I did that. And yes, that's how you pronounce that. It looks like Henry, but the pronunciation guide from the Hurricane Center is Henri. So yeah. have fun with I'm, that. I'm glad that you <laughs> took his $7 from him, Katie. I, yeah, I would do that again. against first. you. I didn't, yeah. You didn't think you'd do it. Well, and otherwise, it's just going to be hot. <laughs> Katie's <laughs> like, let's move on from that. I said it. Okay, I want my $7. I Seven don't want to dwell on it. Let's move Bell. on.